Good afternoon or good evening. Welcome to the Vienna Gödel Lecture 2023. It's the 10th Vienna Gödel Lecture uh, and we have an anniversary. Uh, it started in 2013 with the first uh, Gödel Lecture given by Donald Knutz. Um, I'm, I also welcome the online uh, participants in particular uh, the people from the uh, Austrian Computer Science Day in Graz. Thank you for joining us. Before I have the pleasure to introduce our today's speaker, uh, Professor Carla Gomez, uh, we have uh, two welcoming addresses. Uh, the first by our Vice Rector for Research, um, Professor Johannes Fröhlich, and after him from our Dean of the Faculty of Informatics, uh, Professor Gerti Kappel. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon or good evening, however you will see it. Uh, well, today a renowned lecture series with a renowned scientist. Professor Carlo Gomsch, it's a really pleasure to welcome you here at the renowned lecture uh, series of the uh, Kurt Gödel lecture series that was uh, introduced in informatics some years ago. I don't know when it was really, but it's already tradition. You know, in Austria, things are already tradition if they have taken, uh, if, if you make them for two times or so, but this is by far more that we have already this lecture series. Um, it's on artificial intelligence and sustainability and, uh, you know, uh, uh, in the public and, and, and all those who watch TV, uh, artificial intelligence is, is a sort of hype today because of chat GPT and all the things, uh, which of course uh, is not the, uh, uh, the horizon uh, that uh, is um, uh, covered by uh, artificial intelligence that goes far beyond this horizon. And of course, uh, to have, um, uh, things like chat GPT or other things, you need a lot of basic research and a lot of foundations because in particular for a technical university uh, without foundations, without uh, uh, basic research, no application and no innovation at the end of the day. So it's very important uh, to have uh, research in this in these fields uh, and uh, for this reason and also for this um, for this uh, purpose, Tilwin has bundled the competences in the field of artificial intelligence, you know, we have the kind of the center of artificial intelligence and uh, machine learning, where we bring together the scientists uh, in the field. And of course, this is not something that has uh, just begun yesterday. Um, work on uh, all those foundations that at the end lead to artificial intelligence, machine learning is already uh, uh, in, in a tradition that have been for at least 15 years. Uh, logics and, and reasoning and, and, and all these uh, topics around. If I look back to, uh, uh, I think it was 2009, there was the uh, ESC grant by Professor Gottlob and I think also the starting grant by Professor Seiber at these days. We all have been much younger at, this, at these days. Uh, there also have been ESC grants, two ESC grants by Professor Laura Kovac. Uh, uh, in the in the reasoning area, so you see there is a good tradition in this field of uh, of artificial intelligence or, or of basic research that leads to artificial intelligence, and I think this is a good biotope also for you to have a lecture here. So I'm very pleased that we have you here uh, uh, as a lecturer, and um, I heard that you already had a weekend uh, in Vienna here, and I hope it was a nice weekend. The weather was by far better than now when I changed from another location from Tilwin to here. And uh, at the end, I hope you have uh, still some more good discussions after the lecture. As I already mentioned, I have to excuse after 10 minutes because I have to leave for the next appointment, but it was really a pleasure to get you to know. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, sustainability is, I guess, the cross-cutting topic. 
which influences all our research, teaching, and our daily lives, independent of what science and what scientists, what scientific area we are working in. Computational sustainability is in fact almost a must when you look at the power of the methods and tools we have in our hands nowadays. It was 20 years ago in this very building where the late Turing AWD, Jim Gray gave a presentation. And when the journalist asked him, why are you doing computer science? He said, because computer science is revolu revolutionizing science. I have never heard something like that, which puts it in the, such few words, the most important things that with, we computer scientists with our work, with our daily doing are really changing the world. Nowadays, you will call it AI for science. And that's what exactly our this year Gödel lecturer is also doing in her daily life. And I'm very much looking forward to it. But next to computational sustainability, I think we also have to look at sustainable computing. There are two sides of the coin. And the question is, are we the problem or are we the solution? And when you look at large language models, for example, nowadays about what is the cost of training them, of updating them, of mitigating the biases, we also have a very large responsibility in this area. And I am pretty convinced that the way how we do our research, independent of the specific area in computer science, will change over the next couple of years to make it more sustainable or to work for sustainability. Great to have you here, and we are very much looking forward to your presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, before I start introducing our speaker, um, at the end of the uh, talk, of course, there will be time for questions. Uh, here in the audience, of course, you can uh, ask a question. Uh, we will hand over the microphone. Uh, people who attend via Zoom, please use the Q&A function at Zoom. There you can type in your question and also upvote or downvote, I think only upvote questions there. Also here in the room, if you really are shy or don't want to speak, you of course you can also use here your device to type in your question. And my uh, colleague Chua Chen will read questions that have been uh, asked online. Okay, um, so it is my great pleasure now to um, introduce our today's speaker, Carla P. Gomez from Cornell University. And Carla is an ex exceptional figure in artificial intelligence and computational sustainability. Uh, she's the Nielsen Professor of Computing and Information Science at Cornell University, where she is also the director of the Institute for Computational Sustainability and co-director co of the AI for Science Institute. Carla got her PhD from the University of Edinburgh and has dedicated her career to pursuing knowledge in AI, particularly in large-scale constraint reasoning and uh, optimization and machine learning. Her research has had quite a profound impact on various areas, areas of science, uh, but I think something she is most well known for is being a pioneer in the field, the new field of computational sustainability. I think she will also, uh, that will be the main uh, topic of today's talk. So you, I don't try to explain now what computational sustainability is. Uh, you will hear much more about it in a minute. I think Carla's passion lies in leveraging the power of computational methods 
to address critical problems in environmental, economic, and social challenges. Carla's groundbreaking work has been widely recognized and admired. Her work has appeared in many uh, prominent venues, including the Science Journal or in Nature. And she has received many awards and honors. I won't try to list them all here as you are here to hear uh, her uh, talk and not me speaking, uh, just two very recent ones, the Feigenbaum Prize from 2021 uh, and the El Newell Award from 2022. So Carla is also a fellow of the AAAI, the AAAS and the ACM. But yeah, I'll stop here. Um, please uh, join me welcoming Professor Carla P. Gomes. I'm going to take off my jacket. <laughs> well, it's, I'm very excited to be here. And it is a great honor and privilege to deliver the Gödel Lecture. I want to thank uh, Professor Stefan Zeider and the entire committee for the invitation. I also want to thank the Vice Rector and the Dean for such a warm welcome. And today, I will be talking about AI for accelerating scientific discovery for a sustainable future. So let me give you the roadmap for this talk. Uh, uh, Professor Zyder already mentioned uh, computational sustainability. So I will tell you about sustainability, or computational sustainability, what it means. Then I will talk about AI and the rise of intelligent machines. And then I will delve, delve into explaining and describing how AI can be used to accelerate scientific discovery to make a better world. I will provide very concrete examples, computational sustainability examples concerning bird conservation, protection of the Amazon, the real Amazon, and renewable energy. So what is computational sustainability? Let me start by introducing the notion of sustainable development. Back in 1987, the United Nations Commission on Environment and Development led by Gro Brentland, she was the prime minister at the time. They, this commission produced a very seminal report known as the Brentland Report or Our Common Future. The report, this was back in 1987, raised for the first time serious concerns about the state of the planet. They also introduced the notion revolutionary at the time the notion of sustainable development. Sustainable development is development that meets the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generators, generations to meet their needs. They stress that uh, sustainable development is not just about the environment. On the contrary, it encompasses balancing environmental, economic, and societal needs. And in fact, the ultimate goal of sustainable development is really human well-being of current and future generations. More recently, the United Nations proposed a com comprehensive set of sustainable development goals, 17. And as you will see, they are quite encompassing concerning human well-being, you know, no poverty, no hunger, health, education, equality, economic development, decent jobs, infrastructures, and also climate action and the protection of our land uh, uh, resource, our water resources and land resources. 
So, you know, when we are dealing with these problems, there are many challenges. Back in 2007, the Intergovernment Panel on Climate Change produced a report, and together with uh, uh, Gore, uh, the vice president at the time, uh, you, you asked, actually after being vice president. So this uh, report, the IPCC report, won the Nobel Prize exactly because it uh, emphasized the urgency of us addressing this challenge. And in fact, they stated there are no major issues raised in our common future for which the foreseeable trends are favorable. They highlight global warming, the erosion of biodiversity. For example, at the current rates of human destruction of our natural ecosystems, 50% of all species of life on Earth will be extinct in 100 years. The current uh, IPCC report, the latest one in March 2023, further stressed the concerns raised by the previous report and uh, 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 highlighted the urgency of climate uh, uh, mitigation action. So the reports, and, and we know that the main causes of damage to Earth really results from poor management of our natural resources. Pollution, for example, because of uh, fossil fuels, but also uh, habitat loss and fragmentation because of urbanization, deforestation, agriculture, but also over harvesting of uh, fisheries and forests, etc. So when it comes to the systems, we really need to manage these very complex dynamical systems properly. And in fact, you know, sustainability problems are unique in scale and complexity because indeed we are dealing with complex natural ecosystems such as the Amazon basin or the coral reef, but also man-made ecosystems such as smart cities. So these systems, again, have very complex dynamics with often highly interconnected components, with multiple agents, with different goals and objectives, often actually conflicting objectives. So in order for us to manage and predict this, uh, 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 how to predict and manage these uh, 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 systems, we really need to develop a, a, a computational models that will guide and will provide us with uh, good optimal or at least uh, good interventions. And to do that, we, we, we do this using collecting data, typically lots of data with all kinds of uh, technology, sensor technology, et cetera. It's often actually we are dealing with multiple scales, multiple temporal and spatial scales, uncertainty. So clearly there are significant computational challenges. Yet, unfortunately, traditionally, computer science really do not tackle these sustainability problems. So this is exactly why back in 2008, we propose the creation of this new field that we coin computational sustainability with the vision that computer science can and should play a key role in increasing the efficiency and effectiveness of the way we manage and allocate our natural resources for a sustainable future. Well, we were fortunate because we were helped by our National Science Foundation. Actually, we uh, received a, a large scale $10 million ex expedition in computational sustainability to really, you know, nucleate the field and identify the core research areas for maximal impact, both in terms of computer science and sustainability science. And, you know, 
a few years later, we, we were actually able to apply again to this pro uh, program and we received another expeditions in computing that really allows us to create a large scale research network for expanding the horizons of computational sustainability way beyond uh, Cornell and, uh, and really uh, uh, further uh, uh, um, nurture the field of computational sustainability. Of course, I always like mentioning my students because, you know, they really are uh, my main collaborators or we work very, you know, together and they contribute dramatically to the vision of computational sustainability. And so they play a big role in, in this exciting uh, uh, adventure. So, <laughs> of course, I, I needed to uh, uh, mentioned ChatGPT, I asked ChatGPT, can you explain what computational sustainability is to a 10-year-old? And I'll tell you what ChatGPT wrote, which I actually liked it. Computational sustainability is a way of using computers and technology to help solve environmental problems and make the world a better place for everyone. Imagine that the earth is like a big house and we all live in it. Just like we have to clean up our room and take care of our things so we can live comfortably, we also have to take care of the planet so that it stays healthy and everyone can live well. Computational sustainability helps us take care of the earth and make it a better place for generations to come by using computer models and simulations to figure out how we can use our resources like water, land, and energy in the best way. So I think this is a good summary, correct? So let me now talk briefly about AI. And in particular, we are all witnessing a tremendous progress uh, in AI. You know, AI systems are now demo demonstrating superhuman capabilities on intellectual tasks. For example, you know, Deep Blue defeated Kasparov in 97. Watson defeated two great uh, Jeopardy champions in 2011. More recently, in 2016, AlphaGo defeats the Go World Champion and AlphaZero learn how to play chess and go by itself. So these are quite incredible achievements, but, oh, by the way, as an aside, I was very pleased to see there's actually a tribute to AlphaGo in Vienna. So this picture is, you may recognize this, uh, play, uh, this plaza, and what you see here, I'm sitting on a Go stone. This is actually a, a ghost town, and you can learn about the achievements of a, a half ago they are described here. So, but you know, we are really witnessing this incredible acceleration and the uh, AI is now moving from the academic world to the real world. Obviously, we can have all kinds of apps using our alpha, uh, uh, iPhone, Google Maps, self-driving cars. Of course, uh, AI is also you know, transforming business, medicine, biology, Wall Street, uh, automated supply chains, robotics, uh, uh, assisted uh, uh, remote robotic surgery, uh, genome sequence, etc. And of course, you know, uh, uh, a great achievement is ChatGPT. ChatGPT actually all, has already passed several college level advanced uh, AP courses. The, the score is one to five, the higher the better. Above three, you pass and you see the least history, biology, environmental science, psychology, macroeconomics, etc., and even physics, chemistry, and calculus. So this is quite impressive. In addition, the ChatGPT has also passed medical law and business school exams. So we are making great progress, but 
of course, there's still a long way to go and there are still many challenges that uh, uh, AI uh, is not there yet. We are not there yet. And in particular, I believe that you know, the next frontier for AI, and you know, I have really uh, now uh, focus on uh, AI for accelerating scientific discovery, because scientific discovery does pose, you know, uh, additional challenges, and and so that's what I want to talk to you about today: how we can use AI for accelerating scientific discovery and improving decision making for a sustainable future. So I will give you concrete examples of uh, 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 computational sustainability examples, AI to combat the rapid decline in biodiversity, AI, how we can use AI to reduce the adverse impacts on people and nature of the Amazon hydropower expansion, and also on uh, how we can use AI to accelerate materials discovery for re renewable energy. In particular, we are working with the material science on solar fuels. So a key message that if you will take one message is the power of computer science, the power of AI. And I would call, refer, I refer to this as transferability of AI. A more technical term is how we can use reductions to, uh, you know, we have abstract problems and we can apply across, uh, you know, different domains. And, and that I will uh, show and I will mention how computational models that we developed for bird conservation are also useful and can be used for materials discovery and vice versa. So this is a two-way street. And in fact, I don't expect you to fully understand this picture, but at the high level, what you, and what you see here is a subway line, correct? And the lines correspond to paradigmatic computational problems like pattern demixing, large-scale spatial temporal and structural modeling, or games for mechanism design. These are the lines, and the stations are projects, real projects. And you see, typically, for example, I'm going to talk about bird conservation. It involves different uh, 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 solving different aspects, like citizen science, games for mechanism designed to incentivize citizen scientists, but also large scale temporal and uh, 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 modeling and prediction. So that's the key idea. And the key idea is exactly how, you know, a, a given methodology that we develop in AI for tackling a particular problem can be transferred to many other domains. and. I can, you know, as I mentioned before, develop a method that is going to work for uh, uh, tackling bird conservation problems, but also materials discovery. And I will start by talking about bird conservation. And the AI topic that I will be covering is multi-entity learning and prediction. And I will emphasize the importance of incorporating prior scientific knowledge, the knowledge ecologists have. So a key question, a fundamental question in biodiversity research concerns understanding how different species are distributed across landscapes over time. A simple question is, what birds do I expect to see in my backyard today? So that's what we want to know. Well, understanding and uh, uh, having models to, to address this question is key because this is important for bird conservation efforts. You know, policymakers know where the birds are to go and protect these places, correct? Well, to tackle this challenge, obviously we need to learn about birds. We need to collect information about their migrations, their uh, uh, movements. And so we use all kinds of technology, remote sensing technology for 
uh, data uh, acquisition. And there are many sensors and all kinds of modalities. For example, Landsat is a satellite that has been going around the Earth for over 50 years. But there's an amazing sensor that is the human sensor. That's by far still the best sensor to recognize birds. Well, we have a great lab, the Cornell Lab of Ornithology at, uh, 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 at Cornell, it's the Cornell Lab of Ornithology, uh, has this great program called, called eBird. eBird is a citizen science program that allows you know, anybody interested in science to participate and submit uh, and get involved in bird conservation. So you can submit uh, 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 observations. If you detect a bird, if you see birds, you can report and, and uh, uh, we then can collect all kinds of information about birds. And in fact, I always like mentioning that you, you are uh, James Watson from Watson and Crick started his career as a biologist when he was seven years old, keeping a nice journal, bird uh, uh, observations. So, well, so this program, we have over 750,000 volunteer birders. They have contributed with over a billion bird observations. That's a lot of data. And in fact, it's like building the Empire State Building more than four times. So we use this data and combine these bird observations with environmental data that, you know, from all the sensors. And we use then, you know, deep learning, spatial and temporal deep learning models. And these models essentially relate the environmental predictors to the observed patterns of occurrence uh, and absence and abundance of the species. So essentially, you know, our deep learning models really allows us, allow us to uh, uh, identify, you know, the habitat and uh, migrations of the birds at a very fine resolution. So what you see here is actually the output of uh, our models, the deep learning model. And here we are looking at what it's called species richness, the number of species that we see over time across the US and North America. And let me give you the, uh, it's hard to see this, the darker the color, the fewer the species. When you see light colors like this greenish and yellow, that means lots and lots of species. And if you now pay attention, you see that in March, they arrive in the US, you see all these beautiful light colors, so lots of species. And then they continue going up north to Canada. And then back in September, they again are in the US and they leave the US around October, November, December. This you see very dark. And again, March, they arrive and all these beautiful birds and they go and then they go back again in September. So this is, as I said, the output of a machine learning model. So we have produced lots of different models for different species. And in fact, these models uh, uh, provide the information for the state of the birds report that is actually officially uh, uh, released by the Secretary of Interior. And they are key to inform uh, the different government institutions and NGOs in, in terms of bird preference and movement so that we can have, uh, they can uh, plan conservation efforts. And in fact, they allow very novel conservation uh, approaches because now we have these fine under resolution and these models that really understand the, 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 the bird uh, patterns and migrations. Let me give you just a, a little, a few insights and let me, I want to stress that I am a computer science, I'm passionate about AI, and I'm passionate about using AI 
for addressing this sustainability challenge. Therefore, I really need to team up with experts in the other domains because they know ecology. I don't know ecology. So we listen to the ecologists to really understand what's important for them. And we understood that, for example, they really want to understand species interactions. In fact, I will confess, I really didn't know much what ecology meant, but ecology really means understanding the preference of species with respect to the environment, but also interactions among species. They also have, they know that some models, for example, what they call the multivariate probit model, which is essential, a multivariate Gaussian model really captures the interactions of the species. You know, the same way our metrics are governed by normal distributions, you know, the, the, the interactions of birds are also, and the, the, the normal distributions is all over. That's what characterizes uh, these uh, species distribution models. But, you know, there are many limitations with the current state of the art of ecological models, and even, you know, deep learning models prior to our work, because for example, the ecological models, they really select the features manually to decide, uh, you know, to build their models. They are, uh, these features are, normally they only use eight, 10 features because the models don't scale and they are selected manually. And then it's very difficult to actually train the models. And in particular, I'm not going to be very technical, but you know, these models, we need to uh, estimate the parameters for the covariance matrix. And that is very challenging, even for computer science. So our approach is really, how can we incorporate prior knowledge, in particular, ecological insights into deep learning? You probably are familiar with deep learning or at least or perhaps you've heard, so I will be very brief. Mainly, I will say that neural networks are inspired by uh, 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 the biological neurons. So uh, our uh, uh, net, uh, neural networks, but in a artificial neural network, what you have, you have uh, 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 several inputs and then what your, the neuron is going to produce a weighted sum of the, the, the inputs. So you see the weights here. And then it passes this through an activation function that's typically nonlinear and it produces an output. Mathematically speaking, you have this function that is, you know, an activation function, as I said, it's typically nonlinear, and I show examples of uh, activation functions. And then it goes through this uh, uh, linear combination. This nonlinear function is applied to this uh, linear combination of outputs. And often we introduce this uh, uh, bias or uh, 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 intercept and reproduce an output. So, you know. Deep learning is very powerful. And in fact, you know, typical uh, uh, deep neural networks are very large. You know, you have uh, uh, these, uh, all these networks with lots and lots of neurons and uh, actually many layers. So de facto, you know, a neural network can capture uh, very uh, complex nonlinear functions. Typically, they are black boxes. You, we really don't know what's inside. So we actually say the uh, interpretable layers are, the hidden layers are, are uh, non-interpretable. And they rely on large amounts of data. You know, that's like you, you heard probably chart GPT, you need huge amounts of data. Well, just to give you a perspective, GPT-3, has about uh, 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 estimated 175 billion parameters. These are the little weights that I mentioned before. And GPT-4 has about 100 trillion parameters. So it's formidable, correct? Well, 
when it comes to scientific discovery, it's not the case that you know we have huge volumes of data to, to train. In fact, often scientists reason from first principles, correct? And so a key aspect when it comes to scientific models is really we have to have very interpretable models and our models really need to satisfy scientific principles. And, in, and they also need to reason from first principles to really overcome the fact that we don't have much data. So what's our approach? Our approach, we develop deep learning frameworks where we create these interpretable layers with semantic, or at least we hope there will be, they will have some, you know, clear semantic meaning. So think of variables that we really understand and interpret so that we can uh, 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 use for the scientific discovery and other settings. So then typically we will have an encoder that's going to produce this interpretable layer and then a decoder that is going to produce the output. We also use a reasoning module that now can be applied to my interpretable layer and do logical reasoning, constraint reasoning, and reason about scientific principles. So let me, you know, this is a busy uh, slide. I don't expect you to understand the details, but I want you to see that, you know, essentially this very general framework that I have here, this is what I have here. So I have an input, my input, what is my input? Lots and lots of features, you know, environmental features. And we, we use uh, uh, sound, we use images, we use all kinds of input. And then this is a neural network, the encoder. And this encoder is producing this latent space that has a very well-defined meaning. I have these variables that are basically, you know, keep they are going to learn the, the, the preference of the species with respect to the environment and also the interactions of species. And in fact, this latent space is going to allow me to compute the parameters for the multivariate probit model, the Gaussian model. So with this latent space, I can estimate the mu's and the covariance matrix. I then have this reasoning module that is going to constrain the latent space, the interpretable latent space in this case is ecologists know that typically it's not the case that 500 species are going to, they all interact with each other. So we can constrain this to be a, a, a low covariance matrix. And then we also have the constraint that the output should be this multivariate model. You see here now the output of the model. I already showed you this. Basically now we know exactly how many species I'm going to see at a given location at a given time. But I'm also projecting here the interpret latent space. And you see how now I, the, 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 the interpretable latent space reveals the preference of the species. You may not see this, but land birds obviously prefer the land and uh, uh, you know agriculture uh, environments or trees, etc. But on the other hand, the waterfall prefers the water. But actually, you see that some of the land birds sometimes come to a bit to the water and vice versa, which is normal. And here we also see the other. Our latent space, the interpreter had two parts, one to uh, really uh, uh, understand the preference of the birds with respect to environment, another one to understand the interactions of species, and that's exactly what we have here. Again, I mentioned the subway lines, and I mentioned this notion of transferability of AI. And in fact, for the computer science here, when we develop a methodology, 
I make sure that my students are going to show these methodologies general, and it's not just, you know, a solution that's rigged up for a particular problem. So we have a very general formulation and we actually showed, and in fact, we had a paper like at ICML on EURIPS where we apply this methodology to map the land cover of the Amazon, the real Amazon, or multi-objective de detection. So basically here, you see the analogy with the problem. We want to know what birds am I going to see it? Blue jays, cardinals, ox, etc. Here, I want to know what objects do I expect to see together. And if you have, you know, a, a wheels and a helmet, then you kind of know it's likely to be a bike, etc. So this is really it's the same problem as the problem of uh, uh, identifying birds. It's technically it is a multi-label classification problem, but you know we actually also use these problems for predicting the properties of materials. A given material, what are the different properties that you expect the material will have? And uh, uh, many other domains that I didn't mention here. Well, what is this relevant? We actually work with the Nature Conservancy, which is an NGO, non-government organization, and they, you know, have several conservation efforts. In particular, they have this program called Bird Returns, where the idea is to protect birds and in particular protect migratory water birds in California against drought. You know, California has had tremendous drought. And basically our models are critical here because you see this is the, the Pacific Migration Flyway the models based on eBird will tell, you know, when the species uh, uh, fly over the Sacramento Valley. And so we can target the areas that we would like to protect, or in this case, using combinatorial reverse auctions. And it, in fact, you know, the, the person who led this effort used to be at Wall Street and then moved to uh, this uh, Nature Conservancy. And this combinatorial auctions allow farmers to submit to the nature, to submit bids to the nature conservancy to keep the target rice fields flooded during the periods while uh, the birds are migrating. So this is a much less expensive way of conserving habitat. And in fact, by doing this, the nature conservancy has generated significant additional habitat for water birds in California. And of course, this is only possible because we have these very accurate models that tell, uh, they tell us exactly when the birds are flying uh, over Sacramento Valley and therefore we can have these combinatorial auctions. I want to mention another uh, interesting computational problem that has to do with the fact that we mainly use citizen science data. You know, the citizens submit the data, but because this is they are volunteers, we cannot order them, tell them what to do and where to go. So what we did is we developed this game called Avi Caching. And this game is like the real version of the Pokemon Go game, if you know. And the idea is we want to incentivize the eBirders to visit undersampled locations. And basically, we assign AVI caching points to the places where we want the birders to go and leaderboards. And at the end of the season, they will get prizes. You know, there will be a lottery where they get prizes proportional to the number of points they collected. Well, Technically, this is a very interesting computational model. In fact, it, it is what we call a, a game from a game theoretic point of view. It's called the principal agent framework. And the idea is the principal, which is in the case we are or eBird, you know, the principal wants to uh, uh, reward and set incentives to, you know, induce a good behavior from, for, from the eBirds, we want them to go to undersample uh, areas. 
the, the borders, see the heavy caching points, and then move according to their preferences, correct? And, you know, with their availability. So technically, this leads to what we call a bi-level optimization problem in the sense eBird, the principal has to solve this pricing problem, meaning where should I put, should we put the AVI caching points and how many to induce the desired behavior from the birders. The birders, e-birders see the points and moving accordingly. So another problem that we have to solve is what we call the identification problem. We need to learn the preferences of the e-birders so then we know the preference and how much we need to, I'm going to manipulate them with the incentives and so that we can then set the prices uh, uh, properly. So this is a very interesting problem. It is a two-level game, and we actually develop a, a, a way of flattening them. It's very technical, so I'm not going to go into details. And we actually have a, an approximation guarantee for this game. And more interestingly is our collaborators were so excited about this they implemented the game right away and in fact you know we actually could see people you see they were very uh, 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 concentrated in this area and you see how they uh, sp spread because of these incentives and in fact now you know these uh, other communities are using this game there's also what it's called the desert avi caching there's an initiative in in california to uh, have uh, these huge uh, solar uh, farms uh, uh, in the desert and so they wanted to study how this would affect the bird population so they started the desert avi caching to to study that let me now move on to my next topic. My topic is about how we can use AI to reduce adverse impacts on people and nature due to the hydropower expansion in the Amazon. And here I'm going to talk about uh, 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 the AI topic is multi-objective Pareto optimization. So, you know, over the last 50 years, there has been a tremendous proliferation of hydropower dams in the Amazon basin. So they already have about 200 dams that they, they uh, have already been built or they are under constra construction and they are planning many more of around 400 uh, planned or proposed dams. So not all of them are going to be built. So governments would like some guidance guidelines for strategic planning and you know a key issue here is that of course we build dams for what for energy we want to increase the production of energy but you know dams can also have many other impacts negative impacts in terms of the ecosystem ecosystem services provided by rivers because you know dams can fragment the river and you know reduce river connectivity which really is important for transportation fish migration because of that can dramatically affect the uh, fish biodiversity the transport of sediments and nutrients they can lead to deforestation displacement of populations flooding uh, farmland and you know dams can also uh, uh, induce the uh, uh, increase of uh, greenhouse gas emissions and why is that because they can flood huge areas that lead to the decomposition of organic matter with the release of methane so Basically, we need what I would say more ethical AI decision support systems that cannot really optimize with respect to a single criterion such as energy. So from a computation point of view, we need what we call multi-objective Pareto optimization. So 
what is the Pareto frontier? Basically, the Pareto frontier really captures the trade-offs with respect to the different objectives of different solutions of them portfolios. So let me explain what I mean by that. So imagine along this plot, what you see here is along the X axis is output of energy, hydropower energy, and here is ecological value. Let's say, for example, river connectivity or another metric or several metrics. If I don't build any dam, actually I will keep nature intact. So I keep all the natural, uh, the ecological value, correct? If I build lots of lots of dam, dams, I destroy the uh, ecological uh, value completely. So I will have very high level of energy, but you know, very little ecological value. This is sol solution, and you see basically a solution is what dam should I build? So it's a subset of the 400 dams. This solution is in between. And what you can see is this solution actually dominates this one because this solution has exactly the same output in terms of energy, but much better ecological value. So I want to have algorithms that can rapidly identify dominated solutions. As a concrete example, let's say we are looking at better connectivity. You see, this is the Amazon and this is the river. This is actually a sub-basin. And you see this solution places all the dams here. So it, it does not fragment the river much. On the other hand, this solution has all the dams spread all over. So it really fragments the, the river tremendously. So this one, we prefer this one to this one. Well, you know, this is making, deciding, you know, what dams to select is not a trivial uh, task. And in fact, for you to uh, see the complexity of this problem, there are exactly, you know, in our, uh, our uh, we are looking at 351 proposed uh, dams. So if we are going to select which one to build or not build, we have two to the 351 possibilities, which is about 10 to the 105 possible combinations to look at. So we better get good algorithms because otherwise we, you know, we would stay forever. And in fact, just for you to see the number of seconds since the Big Bang is 10 to the 17, much smaller than this number. And even the estimated number of stars in the universe is 10 to the 22. So basically, if you want to take another message, you really need good foundational algorithms to really scale up solutions for to tackle these problems. And in fact, we actually develop algorithms that compute the exact Pareto frontier for multi-criteria. And we also have what we call efficiently, uh, uh, efficient uh, uh, or approximation. So there's algorithms that are very good because they run very fast. They run in polynomial time to compute the Pareto frontier. Technically, we refer to this as a fully polynomial time approximation scheme. And our algorithms also have very fast ways, uh, you know, and log n to eliminate uh, dominate solutions. I will not go into the technical details, but for you to see how fast they are, you know, for the entire Amazon, we have about 5 million river segments, and we can compute the Pareto frontier for two criteria in about 200 seconds. I mean, this is crazy. Honestly, I was impressed. And as a, 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 a computer science, and you know, I have to say, I was very pleased. Five minutes? This is not possible. <laughs> is it? <laughs> OK. <laughs> I didn't count all the introductions, but that's good. I will do that. Okay, so uh, 
let me then uh, wrap up, but uh, I will finish this. 10 minutes is okay. Can I use 10 minutes? Okay. So, <laughs> uh, so basically, here is the Pareto frontier. And what you see here is the Pareto frontier. If we had not built any dams, you know, back uh, 50 years ago, we would have this beautiful Pareto frontier. Well, unfortunately, we didn't use this technique. So this is our solution today. That's where we are. And what you can see is that we could have had way better results because for this amount of energy, we could have had this environmental benefit. So these are the foregone environmental benefits. Alternatively, we could, for the same amount of ecological uh, river connectivity, we could have, you know, this much energy. So these are the foregone, foregone power earnings. So this is now the Pareto frontier going forward. And we've studied here, the curve, the Pareto frontier is a little inversed because here we want to minimize greenhouse gas emissions. That's why the shape is different. And the punchline here is that, as I mentioned before, if you don't plan this properly, we can actually produce solutions that are dirtier than coal. We looked at many other uh, uh, criteria. You see that, for example, for fish bio biodiversity, uh, uh, we, we see a big gap between the optimal Pareto frontier and the current Pareto frontier for connectivity and also fish biodiversity. And again, I want to hear, because we are looking at multiple criteria, we need to actually put all of them so we use these parallel plots. And again, I want to emphasize that we have lots of collaborators and from the Amazon region, et cetera, and across different disciplines. So I have five minutes, correct? So let me very briefly talk about these super exciting problems. That's where Symbolic AI comes in. So I need to talk about this project because it's very interesting. So basically it's how you use AI to accelerate materials discovery. Materials discovery, you know, back in 2010, the Obama administration proposed the genome initiative, very exciting initiative. And just to give you a sense of what materials discovery is about, you know, the idea is to discover new materials. And so basically material science use this co-sputtering where they let's say use three metals like gold, uh, silver and platinum, and they mix them up like atomic spray painting. Then they take X-ray diffraction patterns you know, they collect X-rays just like Watson use X-rays to see the structure of DNA. And then the big challenge is based on an X-ray, how can we infer the crystal structures of the materials? So, you know, this is really a daunting task that takes a long, you know, while we can synthesize uh, thousands of materials a day or material scientists, they can do interpret a few systems a year because it's very challenged. So we have SARA that is, we are developing SARA that basically is a robot scientist that really encapsulates the scientific method from formulating hypotheses, planning, executing experiments and interpreting the results. So, you know, these problems are challenging and contrarily to chat GPT, we don't have tons of data in fact, typically there's only a, 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 a few data and unlabeled data, and we need interpretability and understanding of causation. And basically we need to be able to uh, incorporate, you know, physics principles, which standard machine learning techniques don't, don't do. So we need to use what we call symbolic AI. How can we combine learning with logical constraint uh, probabilistic reasoning? And that's what we did. We developed these deep reasoning networks to do that. This problem is very complicated. So I'm just going to give you a very simple example that illustrates this. If I ask you to look at this, can you tell me what's there? Well, 
you see some symbols, some letters, some numbers, but you don't really, for example, here there's a maybe a seven and something here, an E. So it's not clear. But now, if I give you additional information, which I'm going to refer to as prior knowledge, like scientists know about the, the science, I tell you this actually is the result. Basically, what you see here is two overlapping Sudokus, one using digits from one to nine and one using letters from A to I. And I tell you the Sudoku rules that you cannot repeat a symbol in a row, column, and uh, uh, block. Now with this information, deep reasoning networks, our framework, our machine learning, deep learning that has this reasoning module that can reason about constraints and logic constraints by reasoning about the Sudoku rules without labeled data to train on, the, it can basically identify that this matrix is actually once so demix them in two sudokus, one using letter, numbers and the other using letters. And, you know, basically this is the structure of the network. I just want to emphasize that this was actually heavily inspired by the bird network where here, you know, for the Sudoku, I keep track of the probabilities of the, the digits in each cell and the shape of the, 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 the digits and have here uh, 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 an encoder producing this latent space, a decoder, which is a, a conditional GAN that reconstructs the image. And this is where the symbolic reasoning comes in. We can reason about uh, Sudoku rules. And you see the analogy with the, the bird, uh, 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 the um, uh, deep learning framework for uh, uh, studying bird distributions. Well, for the, it turns out that this problem, in fact, you know, the materials discover problem is a very similar problem. We are given a collection of points. We have the, the, the X-ray diffraction patterns in the spectrograms. And what we want to do is we want to identify, you know, the different regions where it's like for the different cells, I want to identify where, you know, if this region is just made of a nine or there are many uh, areas. And in this case, what we see here is we have, for example, this point is a pure phase, while this point is a mixture of phases, so I need to separate them. So, you know, computationally speaking, the mixing Sudokus or the mixing X-ray diffraction patterns is very similar. And, and we use this uh, uh, reasoning. And in fact, basically, the, the problem of material crystal structure phase mapping is actually what we call unsupervised pattern demixing, the same as demixing Sudokus. But what's even more exciting is we are working on other problems that is, they are also demixing problems. For example, we have recordings from the forest and we want to demix sounds. And here, for example, we have to separate the, the, the birds and the bird sounds or the elephant calls, etc. Well, again, you see the analogy in terms of the, the framework. Basically, in fact, we first solved the crystal structure phase mapping. And then when we had to write a paper, I, we made up this Sudoku problem. But indeed, it's a similar problem. And here you see how the network actually discovers certain crystal structures and is able to demix them. You see the different regions here, contrary to the Sudoku, we don't know a priori if a, a different material has one crystal structure or two or three. So we need to infer that and learn. And we actually, uh, our collaborators, uh, you know, DR Nets, our framework led to the discovery of, uh, you know, new uh, uh, energy, uh, new materials for solar fuels. And this is the team. And I just want to summarize again with, you know, this 
uh, subway line, this idea of transferability of AI, and maybe more important, the fact that, you know, this is a very exciting area, and I see this, uh, you know, going back to the key message of, our, of your dean, <laughs> that, uh, you know, this is a two-way street, that on one hand, you know, we, we hope that, you know, computer science and AI can inject computational thinking and provide insights and methodology and solutions to tackle these problems. But by being exposed to these problems that we encounter new situations that lead to new developments and need to advance in our own field. So this is incredible, exciting. And obviously, you know, the idea is that we hope to have societal impact. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, it's very nice that at the end you had to go back to computational thinking. Janet Wing was one of the Gödel lectures a couple of years ago. Janet Wing gave me the first expedition in computing awards. She was at NSF. <laughs> Interesting. All right. So, yeah, um, now it's time for questions. And uh, I think we should start, start with questions here from the live audience. So please don't be shy. Any questions? Hello, uh, thank you for this talk. I actually uh, realized that I had completely misunderstood the concept of computational uh, sustainability because what you talked about now was uh, for me, um, computation for sustainability. And I wanted to ask you whether sustainable computation, which I thought you were talking about today, uh, is a, an issue in your research and um, how strongly it is driven by actual environmentalism and sustainability and not by just um, you know, trying to reduce cost. Because the larger language models we talked about today, they use a lot of energy, they lose, use a lot of space. Um, yeah, how is this part, uh, how does it relate to um, what you showed us today? And thank you again. Excellent question. And yes, you know, uh, the short answer is sustainable, sustainable computing is part of computational sustainability. And as you uh, emphasize, it, it, in fact, it's becoming, you know, more and more of an issue because indeed we are, you know, building these huge models that really uh, 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 require tremendous computational resources, you know, for us to train these models. And so that has tremendous impact in terms of energy consumption and the carbon footprint. So there's a whole area actually now, uh, uh, sub area in computer science, really uh, addressing uh, uh, sustainable computing issues, you know including how to you know have much better faster algorithms because that is so key but also how to use renewable energy instead of uh, 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 you know more traditional energy in fact the the large companies you know and there's really a, a pressure to to try to uh, come up with better solutions because of their bo bottom lines you know they spend a lot of money so they are uh, so there's a movement to, to look for renewable energy from solar from wind etc but you know there are many other uh, uh, you know strategies that you can adopt to really uh, 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 have more sustainable computing excellent question okay um while people still think about their questions uh, maybe you you can we we talked about this uh, um, over lunch maybe you can uh, explain a little bit how this um, collaboration with uh, experts in these various fields, how this emerges, because you said yourself, 
you you are not an expert in all these uh, uh, fields, so you are a computer scientist. How these interesting uh, collaborations uh, uh, emerge? Yes, a very good question. Yes, so so I try to emphasize this key aspect that uh, you know. If I'm going to work on bird conservation, materials discard, I better, you know, I really need to have experts to can, uh, you know, advise because, you know, computer science are very good at pontificating about things they <laughs> don't know much about. And the worst thing you want is us for us to invent, reinvent a bad will, correct? We, we don't want to do that. So, that actually reflects, you know, the choice of problems that uh, uh, I end up working, uh, uh, focusing on, are very much a function of having access to the experts. Why am I doing bird conservation? Because Cornell has this amazing lab of ornithology. So I have access to the highest level of expertise. Why am I working on materials discovery? because you know cornell has uh, you know a, a large group in fact uh, 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 we have a, a, a center actually now changed the name for fuel cells and uh, and so you know that's uh, 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 key and uh, you know then how basically it's a bit of again a two-way street you know they they learn about the kinds of things that I'm doing, they come to me, but I also try to identify problems that are aligned with my ex expertise. You know, if they ask me to work on quantum computing, I don't do quantum computing, so, uh, you know, but, you know, because I have, uh, and, you know, my background is actually more on the symbolic AI initially, al more algorithmic AI, and so, I, you know, one of the first problems that I worked on was on designing wildlife corridors for uh, uh, protecting species. And, you know, mathematically speaking, you know, this is a graph problem. You, you have a graph and you have several reserves. For example, in the US, uh, Yellowstone, uh, the Glacial Park and the Salmo Salway system, and you wanted to connect these reserves so that the grizzly bears could travel and socialize with the friends, correct? Well, you know, this problem is very algorithmic, and that is the uh, 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 Steiner tree problem that actually is used for when you are setting up a, um, a, a video conference, you are exactly solving the same problem. You see this transferability where you have different uh, uh, um, uh, computers and you want to find the best way of connecting them. So, you know, this problem, I, I remember reading about it in, the, in you know, the New York Times have had a, 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 an article about how to protect, you know, the species and designing corridors. And, you know, I thought, oh, this is amazing. So I, you know, actually went to this city and regional planning department and uh, identified some researchers there, actually a student who was design working on wildlife corridors and, you know, in fact, initially he wanted to work on a little wildlife corridor just for, you know, Maryland. I said, no, no, let's go big because we can scale up and, you know. So, you know, it's a bit of a two-way street where, you know, you find problems that are aligned with your interests, and but then you really need to have access to the experts and uh, and uh, uh, who can really uh, work with you and, and are knowledgeable about the domain. Do we have any online questions? There's a question over there. Uh, okay. Oh. Yeah. Um. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't mean to. Thank you. So if I understand correctly, then you're kind of an ambassador for computational methods in other disciplines like ecology and uh, biology and hydrology and so on. Is, is educating and training the researchers and students in these areas part of your mission in a sense to, to teach these computational methods to students in other fields so that they can apply them themselves without having the need to, to find computer scientists help us? 
I, I have to say, I have difficulty with the sound. So, but I thought your question is educating other fields. Is it part of uh, our mission? Yes, you know, obviously that is indeed, uh, uh, you know, a big part. And in fact, we just started a, a program that uh, a center AI for science. Uh, and and essentially we we are working with postdocs from other disciplines from material science from biology from astronomy and and uh, we have you know this program that uh, part of our mission is really to you know expose them to uh, ai and uh, and uh, uh, train them so that the AI can really impact the different disciplines. But again, you know, I always like to say that, you know, by being exposed to these problems, we actually often advance our own field. So. Thank you very much. Um, on the topic of sustainable computation, would you consider it to be more important to improve our energy usage? by using, for example, more efficient algorithms and improving our hardware that we run our algorithms on? Or would you say it is more important to actually focus on, on the problem itself by using more energy to come up with better solutions? Like, is there a trade-off between those two? Yes, there's always a trade-off. Indeed, you know, we want to use, you know, to design better algorithms to have more uh, efficient solutions. And, you know, but often it is another issue because we, we ended up having, you know, more uh, capability. So we now want to, you know, run bigger models. And uh, it, so, so there are always trade-offs, but, but indeed, you know, for sustainable computing, there are many, many uh, approaches to trying to, you know, mitigate the, the, the carbon footprint, et cetera. And, ranging from, as I said, you know, more efficient algorithms, more efficient architectures, you know, there are, you know, the areas of uh, systems that areas of algorithms, uh, the area of, uh, um, you know, using other sources. So, and, and, and I'm glad you mentioned that because in general, uh, for anything we do, you really need to actually understand the trade-offs, correct? That was the example with the hydropower dam expansion where, you know, yes, we may design, you know, try to have this clean energy, but be careful because there are many other impacts. So we want to understand these trade-offs and therefore I think it's important to, 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 to really, you know, even design novel algorithms that can reason about these trade-offs. Thank you. Yeah, uh, speaking of trade-offs, uh, you've uh, mentioned that you've discussed the incorporation of constraints and uh, interpretability of your models, but uh, you haven't discussed the impact on the accuracy of the model. The uh, impact on the accuracy yeah, of- Yeah, like what, how does the accuracy get uh, affected by- uh, Excellent question. I love Thank that. You. I love that question. And, and in fact, you know, one of the reasons why you want to incorporate prior knowledge and, uh, you know, via reasoning modules and constraints, because you actually want to, you know, uh, uh, give your algorithms or your deep learning methods uh, a way of generalizing outside the training data. And in fact, you know, the example that I went a billion, a million kilometers an hour, but this materials discovery problem is an extreme example where we really don't have labeled data. And the reason we can, you know, solve this problem is because we incorporated logic and reasoning constraints that, you know, look at the data do the reconstruction using the machine learning, but then reason about thermodynamic rules, just like the Sudoku rules, to disambiguate the solutions. They, so, so, so to answer the question is, and I love that question, for example, for the Sudoku, we actually showed, we compare our algorithm that did not train on 
overlapping digits against an algorithm like a capsule net, I don't know if you are familiar, that actually trained on, uh, 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 we gave training data. So what we discover is that our approach could have better digit accuracy and better Sudoku accuracy than all the other models. In fact, the other models, the Sudoku accuracy was a disaster because, you know, if you make a little mistake identifying a digit, in fact, we also try to couple, you know, just a standard machine learning method with the SAT solver. But, you know, unless you incorporate and you embed the, the reasoning pro process into the recognition, because there are two tasks, correct? There's the perception to recognize the digits, and then there's the reason to reason about the Sudoku rules. So, if you decouple these two tasks, the results are not very good. But now if you embed the reasoning into the deep learning, so they are working together and the accuracy goes up dramatically. And in fact, that is a form that is key to generalizing to very different uh, 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 test sets. So, so, and in fact, to do sh few shot learning because you learn the principles underlying your problem. So it's like a scientist, you know, a scientist does not need to see a billion cats to know this is a cat or we don't need to do that. So if you reason from first principles, then your message generalize much, much better. Excellent question. Thank you. I think there is an online question. Hello. Oh. There's a question from Lucas, and he has a specific specific question regarding the Pareto frontiers. And he asked, "How do you deal with the multitude of objectives? For instance, can you really put uh, ecological loss in one number, or do you deal with multiple uh, Pareto frontiers?" So, how do I deal with multiple objectives? Correct. Now that that is a profound question. Because indeed, you know, a way how we potentially would do this is to assign weights to the different objectives and have a single objective function with weights, correct? But to do that, you know, there are problems because they have very different scales. And maybe I would have to, you know, find a way of normalizing them, et cetera. The way we deal is we actually reason uh, 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 in terms of the different uh, objectives separately. And, you know, if I'm going to be a little technical, it turns out that this problem, we are deciding where to the best locations for hydropower dams in this river network. And what's the beauty about a river? Well, it's a tree, correct? Technically speaking, it has the shape of a tree. That means there are no cycles, correct? And because of that, we are able to develop these you know, algorithms that I technically is referred to a fully polynomial time approximation scheme that's essentially based on dynamic programming where we can, the algorithm can reason simultaneously uh, uh, with respect to all the objectives without having to combine them, but then it uses this three property to really round solutions and eliminate solutions and do it in a very, very fast way. And we also use, you are familiar, for example, with sorting, correct? It's a, a key problem in computer science, how we sort a list of numbers. And there are algorithms such as, you know, bubble sort or a, a, a other a merge sort that you do uh, uh, divide and conquer. So here we also use this divide and conquer strategy to really have a very, very fast algorithm and be able to reason about the different criteria. I'm not sure if I... Uh, I guess because he didn't ask for us uh, other questions. Thank you. Thank you. So as there are no further questions here, 
um, before we end by thanking you for this great talk, uh, please uh, keep your applause just for one more minute um, I, for two very short announcements. First of all, I um, of course thank you for coming. It's very really great to have you here and hear your insight. Um, I also would like to uh, uh, announce it, or you maybe have seen it. Um, tomorrow in the afternoon, there's another uh, event. And uh, it's not a coincidence that we have another uh, a prominent computer scientist from Cornell University here, Bart Selman. And uh, Bart and Carla will uh, meet uh, at uh, four o'clock in uh, Hoyer and Palsplatz, which is literally 100 meters uh, from, from this lecture room. In, I think in a very friendly atmosphere there, and they will talk about uh, connections between Wittgenstein, Gödel, and ChatGPT, which is, uh, I think, uh, I'm, I'm really looking forward to this. I, I'm sure it will be a very interesting discussion. So uh, please uh, try to make time coming tomorrow at four o'clock. Um, of course, I also would like to uh, um, thank uh, uh, those who help organizing this, in particular, uh, Teresa Eichinger and uh, Lara Gabovic. Uh, thank you very much for uh, putting all this together. And finally, last but not least, uh, thank you, Carla, for this very interesting, inspiring talk. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for having me.